So that's the battle. Now, in your daily moment-by-moment life, it's kind of grueling, okay? It's it's the thing that's in the the video picture that I use so much. Second Corinthians ten five, bringing every thought into captivity to Christ. That means the doctrine, the words that were in His head, for He became the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, into captivity. You're you know people in this world. Take God captive to religion. Take God captive to politics. And 99.9% of Christianity is that way. 99.9% of Judaism too. And really, if you wanted to expand the analogy, it's true for all, all of them. Any claim of a faith in God, pretty much 99% of whatever that faith claim is, it has nothing to do with God himself. It has to do with trying to make that faith claim your badge. So it's being done to serve your ego, not anything to do with God. So your first battle is that since that's the, the, the urge... And that goes back to the first temptation. Adam and the woman, he put her above God. Since that's the urge, every single moment you're alive, you're going through a battle. And that's why it's grueling. Okay? Your sin nature wants to make God captive. But the goal of the spiritual life is to make your thoughts captive. And of course, your sin nature is part of that. So it's the opposite of your own nature to start with. That's what makes it grueling. So that's why it's so important to try and get in the habit because then your body is that's usually against you is going to be turned sort of like in your behalf. If you get in the habit, the physical habit, of mentally associating everything you do with your body with something in the Bible, your body is going to sooner or later kick that up in spite of the sin nature, it won't be consistent, but it will happen more and more often. Your body will kick up something to do with the Bible every time you're engaged in the same activity again. Like, I can't even watch a movie without thinking of Scripture. I can't open my refrigerator without thinking of Scripture. Well, I mean, can't is not right. Generally, when I open my refrigerator, generally when I watch a movie, generally when I write an email, generally when I look at anything in my life, I'm reminded of something of Scripture or something about God because so many times that association has been made. And I ask God, and you, you should do that too, you know, pray to God to cause you to see an association. Pray to God to remind you. Okay? Because you really want his pick of what he sh you should associate anyhow. And it's a fun game, really. And it's it's turned into a game, and a lot of the time it's pleasant, but a lot of the time it's grueling. And like, I just laid down right now to record, because I, I caught myself doing something where I didn't have him in mind. And oh, I'm off the grid. 2 Corinthians 10.5 is not applicable, and I treat, you know, confess my arrogance, Dad. I mean, it's not necessarily a sin, but I wish, you know, sort of wish that it were. I mean, if you're, if you're off the grid and you're not thinking toward God, sooner or later you're going to sin. So I must have sinned because I wasn't thinking toward Him when I did it. And my big problem in the spiritual life, maybe this is true for you too, is what I call sequencing. I'm not thinking of him first when I go to make a decision. I'm looking at the item that I got to decide on and deciding on it. A lot of times while I'm in the middle of deciding on it, I'll think of him. But the sequence is still wrong. I need to think about him first. And then, okay, Dad, what do you think of this thing? Here's the decision that I got to make. Write an email, go to the bathroom. What do you think? And then, you know, he'll basically say what's right, what's wrong about it. And and that can get to be kind of a hassle. But it's better because then I'm training my body to first ask that question. What does God think? 
And in that sense, your body, which is normally your your first adversary, can become your first friend. That's what Christ did. And it's real important to know that. And and my pastor made a big stink about this very thing because he's called that to my mind now. Thank you, Dan. Because when he was covering Matthew 4, in about, I want to say it's around less than 800 of... Um, 1992 Spiritual Dynamics, Series 376 at www.rbtheme.org. When he was covering that, he was explaining why Christ could resist the temptation so deftly. Because what Satan said to him was, and I'll have to put it in the same kind of tone, Oh, please speak these stones into bread. It's called the imperative of entreaty in Greek. And so when Satan was talking to him, he was, half of him was like really heartbroken that Christ was so hungry and taking advantage of his own uh, admiration of Christ, Satan uses it as an opportunity to stick in the temptation. See, speak these stones into bread is a suggestion to the subconscious of a human when you're hungry the word bread coming to a hungry mind is going to conjure an imagining of bread. If Christ did that, the stone would have turned into bread because he really is God. You get that. So it's a very subtle temptation. Satan is taking advantage of his knowledge of the human psyche and what it does when it's, hun when it's hungry. And he was trying to get Christ to imagine bread. And Christ's thought process was so centered on God first in its sequence that when he hears the word bread, the first thing he thinks of is God. You shall live on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God, which is Deuteronomy 8.3. So the first thing that hits his mind when he hears the word bread is not imagining bread, but Bible, different B. See how clever that is? This is what I mean by sequencing. Okay? The first thing that hits his mind is a different B. Bible. Deuteronomy 8.3 You won't live on bread alone. See the word bread? Reminds him of Bible because it's a word in the Bible. You don't live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Deuteronomy 8.3 See how clever that is? So that that's why he didn't sin. See, for him it would have been a sin. Because to imagine bread would have turned the stones into bread, and that's what he wasn't allowed to do. It was designed to test him to get his own integration between his human nature and his divine nature to strengthen. Because the human nature, of course, is the weak one. Okay, he was tempted in all ways, yet, as we are yet without sin. Hebrews, end of Hebrews 2 and end of Hebrews 4. Okay? How do you get that way? How is it that we don't sin in heaven, see? The battle, the integration battle is going to go on in heaven too. How do you know? Because Christ is perfect and it went on in him. The human is still temptable. The reason God isn't temptable is because he's omniscient and he just doesn't like what he knows. And he knows whatever he wants to know. And he wants to know everything. I mean, he determines what the everything is. And everything that he knows, that he determines, that sin is, he doesn't like. So there's just no, nothing is capable of tempting him, is the way it ought to be translated in Hebrews 6. It says it's impossible that God be tempted. No, it's impossible for anything to tempt him. Is the way it should be translated. It's the impossibilities in the thing being powerful enough to tempt God. Okay? 
But we're not God. We're going to have God's thought flowing through us, but we're not God. So how is it we don't sin? And this is the really scary part of it. What it ends up meaning is that the soul of a person who never learns Bible doctrine is like the size of a mustard seed. It's a small soul. It's small-minded. Its, it's interests are small. Its thought pattern is small. Its processing is small. Its throughput is small. Everything about it is tiny. That's why it doesn't sin. Only Bible doctrine can grow your soul. And what it grows is your knowledge, your understanding. You're connecting the dots, and therefore you're not tempted. I mean, you're tempted, but you don't sin. Christ was tempted, but he doesn't sin. And he didn't then. Why? How is that possible? Because Bible is the first thing that comes to his mind. The sequence Okay, you got a sequence of events. Thought hits your mind. Your volition has to decide what you're going to do with that thought. It could hit your mind from within you. It could hit your mind from without you. It doesn't matter. It hits your mind. What do you do with that thought? You have to decide. Volition. Volition has to look someplace to decide. Where do you look? Christ first looks at God. Christ first looks at the Word. So the believer who's growing in Christ is learning that same sequence. Okay? It's a battle. It will be a battle a billion years from now. You're going to be dead in, I don't know what, how old you are now, but pretend you're 30. You'll be dead in 70 years. 70 or 80 years tops. Okay? That's part of what I do for a living, is predict longevity. Okay? You're going to be dead in 70 or 80 years tops. Maybe sooner. A billion years from now, you will still be doing a battle. But it's kind of like watching a movie. You know, when you watch a movie and they're all fighting, I don't know why, but there's a certain enjoyment of watching the fight. And some people tell me there's an enjoyment in the fight. I don't identify with that. That's a flaw in my character. I don't enjoy fighting. I just don't. I want it to be over with. I do it because I have to. And I want it to be over with as soon as possible. I hate it. But there is a valid enjoyment in fighting. And you probably know what that is. You've probably experienced it. I think I probably have too, but... I, it's not coming to mind right now. So you'll be fighting and enjoying the battle a billion years from now. Every day. You're battling every day now. You'll be battling every day of mil you know, a billion years from now. The difference between now and then is you'll enjoy it. You'll understand it. You'll get a lot out of it. It will always be profitable to you every moment of every minute of, along the process. You don't actually have to come to the end. And, of course, you never do, of the process to enjoy it. Down here, we think that it's not enjoyable until you win. And some people learn how to enjoy it before you win. And some people learn how to enjoy it whether you win or lose. Those are the happiest ones. The battle for integration will never end. Now, this battle goes on, and you learn gradually to enjoy it, but what kind of battle is it? In my case, and in really every case, too, but some people master it better than me, sequence. And the sequence is illustrated by Christ. He gets hit by the thought of bread. Which in his case, because he's God-man, if he imagined it, that's what would happen. See, auto-suggestion. Turn stones, speak stones in the bread. It's literally what Satan said. Speak the stones in the bread. Not turn them, speak them. God speaks a thing and it is. That's in Genesis 1. Because he's the God of Genesis 1-1. Alright? So speak the stones in the bread. And if he did that, the suggestion hitting his brain, the thought will automatically 
like imagine doing the action because it's a suggestion even in order to consider yes or no you imagine in his case that would have been too much and the first thing he thinks about when he hears the word bread is Deuteronomy 8.3 instead of imagining bread that's the deafness and you will understand that better once you're dead and in heaven because it's going to happen to you too Okay, but the thing is, you can start practicing it now. And that's what the battle is. Sequencing and other issues. What comes to your mind first? Is it the thing? Is it how you feel about it? Is it your opinion? Is it your feeling? Is it somebody else's opinion? Somebody else's feeling? What hits your mind first? It's kind of like the ultimate Rorschach test. I don't know if you're familiar with Rorschach test. It was in the 1950s and really it's not a very good test. It's supposed to help diagnose personality disorders and intelligence. It's really not very good at either one. And basically what happened is, among other things, somebody devised a set of ink blots. And the tester will show you this ink blot. And you're supposed to tell the tester what that ink blot looks like to you. First thing that comes to your mind. Sequence. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? And after you've done like 20 of them, I think there were 30 of them, might have been only 10. Um, the tester gets a profile of your psychological personality supposedly from all those associations between the picture you see and the word that you bl blurt out okay now in point of fact there is a sort of you know psychological makeup but the here the issue is is to get that association to be Bible every time you see a picture every time you do an activity every time you look at something what Bible comes to mind what about God comes to mind first and if that's not happening first then what is happening first and that's a way you can diagnose yourself spiritually okay in your copious free time between 12 and 3 in the morning how you diagnose yourself spiritually or psychologically even if you want because it's a better test now that's the battle is to get it so and that's what second corinthians 5 10 5 is talking about so that every thought is brought into captivity to christ he's talking about matthew 4 he's talking about the first temptation so that the first, whatever your thoughts are, the first thought you next have is what does the Bible say? What does God say? What is your opinion? Instead of something else. And just like Christ was tempted, you're constantly being tempted. And this is going to be true a million years from now. A billion years from now. You're constantly tempted to do something or think something else first. And the joy of it is that you get to the place where you think of him first. That's what Paul's talking about there. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5. And Paul loved fighting. He, he enjoyed fighting. That's all he ever talks about. Fighting and sex. Those are his two big themes in his books. You can't see it in the English because he's making all kinds of wordplay that the translators cover up. Okay. Fighting in pregnancy, fighting in birthing, fighting in intercourse, fighting in sex. Okay, that, that's, that's it with Paul. Of course, those were the two big, you know, thrills of the Roman Empire, too. And today. Paul loved fighting. He was Benjaminite. The Benjaminites were really good at fighting. They were renowned for it. Tribe of Benjamin, if you wanted to hire good fighters to be mercenaries or to protect your caravan, you hired Benjaminites. That was where Saul was from. King Saul. Okay. Ben. Yamin. Okay, son of an auspicious child. Yamin means auspicious child. 
well, just child, but it, it has a sort of connotation of this one is really special. Son of the special, special child of the son, son of, you know, kind of goes on from there. Okay? So, you want the Yamin meaning. The Yamin meaning is Bible first. And that's a victory. So if you're into fighting, if you love fighting like, you know, guys are supposed to like fighting. I don't understand it, that they necessarily do. And a whole lot of girls like fighting. If you're into fighting, well, that's a victory. Count it as a victory. I thought of Bible first. Oh, I thought of God first. That's the battle, and that's how it's supposed to be enjoyable. And I'm going to start to cry now. So I'm going to hang up.